But right now, let's please welcome Charles McClelland for the South American Wars of Independence. Hello, everybody. I'm so glad you came back. That pirate lecture is a hard one to, to follow. And I, my wife and I were talking about uh, this particular topic, and she said, yeah, it's really boring. And so, <laughs> I'm sorry, Marianne, I'll pay for that later. Um, but I, I will promise you, I will make it as exciting as possible. I've, I've given you my email address there I, for um, a couple of purposes. Number one, if you want the bibliography for all of my lectures, not just the ones I've given here, but all 20 or so of them, uh, just send me an email. I'll send it to you as a Word file. If you have any suggestions about future uh, presentations, I'll be happy to, really anxious to hear any suggestions you might have, as well as follow-up questions on, on the uh, presentations I've already made. Um, <clears throat> now, as a senior citizen, I think I'm well qualified uh, to share a few stories about senior citizens. I've earned that right. And uh, so three older gentlemen were sitting on the park bench solving the world's problems. And um, one of them turned to the other two and said, um, 15 years from now, what do you want your family to say about you? And one of the older gentlemen said, well, you know, I'd like them to say that I was really good at business. I was a good provider. I took good financial care of my family. And uh, the second one said, you know, I'd like them to say he was a great dad and a wonderful grandfather. And um, uh, I want them to remember me that way. And then they turned to the third one and said, how would you like to be remembered? And he said, you know, what I'd like them to say is, doesn't he look good for his age? <laughs> okay, and one other thing. We, we, we believe in gender equality here. Uh, grandmother is sitting down and watching the television, and her grandson comes up to her uh, and says, Grandma, I have a confession to make. I ate all of the peanuts in the bowl. And Grandma said, don't worry. That's okay. Ever since I lost my dentures, all I can do is suck the candy off of them. <laughs> okay, let's get going. A more serious topic. I, you know, I, I decided to look into this, as with a lot of my presentations, I was curious. I've traveled throughout Central and South, great deal of land, large plantations. Uh, they owned all kinds of commercial enterprises. And the king of Spain decided he needed to take some of that wealth back from them. So he reduced the economic activities of the church, took back some much of the land. But not only that, even more importantly, the parish priests, who were the local representatives of the king of Spain, they were the ones who represented his authority and his legitimacy. He undercut them and took away all of their uh, various non-spiritual activities and said, you will just focus on spiritual things. And by undercutting the authority and legitimacy of the parish priests who were his representatives locally, he undercut his own legitimacy and authority. Now about this time, there was a school of thought in Europe called the Enlightenment that emphasized constitutional government limiting the power of kings. This was very, very revolutionary. These are some of the philosophers that, you, that are associated with the Enlightenment. Uh, and also, a very important message of the Enlightenment is that reason and logic are the primary source of authority and legitimacy, not the office and power of the king. This was very revolutionary. So a lot of the Creoles went to Europe in order to receive a, a university education. They were exposed to the Enlightenment uh, theories. Now, coincidentally, at this period in history, we're talking about uh, the very beginning of uh, the 1900s, another, I'm sorry, the, the beginning of the 1800s, the 19th century. There were a number of revolutions that took place around that period of time. The American Revolution. And Spain supported the American colonies in their fight against uh, England. And so here their colonists are in uh, South America and Central America and so forth. And seeing that their own mother country is supporting another group of colonists to break away from their mother country. 
And that message was not lost on the Creoles. The French Revolution, uh, it, the divine right of kings was uh, destroyed, uh, liberty, equality, fraternity. Uh, that was a very inf great influence on these Creoles in the New World. And then finally, the revolution in Hispaniola, uh, a very, very horrible, bloody revolution where the uh, freed slaves rose up against their old masters, and it was an absolute massacre. <clears throat> so that was going on. But more important than these other four things was the political instability in Spain. Napoleon Bonaparte invaded Spain and Portugal both. And he imprisoned King Fernando VII in France. In effect, he put him in a, in a prison in, in uh, France and installed his own brother Joseph uh, Bonaparte on the throne. Now, in southern Spain, he didn't conquer all of Spain. In southern Spain, there was a large area that was independent of this French king of Spain. And they established a constitution of Cadiz, which was a very revolutionary document. It limited monarchy subject to parliamentary control. Up to that point in time, the, the king of Spain had been very much uh, unconstrained by any kind of, of control by a parliament. In addition, all Spanish subjects except the mulattoes and the blacks. So in other words, the Creoles and the mestizos became full citizens. This was a major step forward. Now, they were equal in, theoretically, in influence and authority as the peninsulares, who supposedly uh, had more power and influence, but now they did not any longer. Well, when Napoleon Bonaparte saw that this kind of thing was going on, he said, okay, I'm going to take um, Ferdinand the Seventh and put him back on the crown. He was sort of a puppet king at that point in time, and, and Napoleon Bonaparte was holding the strings. He reinstalled Fernando, Ferdinand the Seventh, and who then revoked the constitution of Cadiz, because this constitution, he was not at all in favor of these things, as you can imagine. And then there was a revolt uh, six years later, and the constitution of Cadiz was restored. Now, just for a minute, imagine you're a Creole in the New World, and a puppet king, Joseph Bonaparte, has now been a Frenchman, for crying out loud, has been become king of your country. And he, he is sending his representatives overseas to rule over the New World. They were outraged. There was consternation. What's going on back in the mother country, for crying out loud? It was, they, they were just really confused. But the Creoles saw an opportunity to change the power structure in their favor. All of this chaos in Spain, it wasn't lost on them that this perhaps represented an opportunity that they had not had before. So, the rebellions began. And here's a map of uh, Spanish and Portuguese America in 1780, but it's, it's true at this period of time as well. Broken into three viceroyalties, New Granada, Peru, that consisted of these two parts, and Rio de la Plata. We'll talk about Brazil a little bit later on, towards the end. But things started in Buenos Aires. This is their concord. Uh, in, you know, as, as an analogy to the American Revolution. Buenos Aires. <clears throat> in May 18 to 25 of 1810, a group of Creole lawyers, the viceroy who had been sent by that French pretender, they removed him. And they had something called a cabildo, which is a town meeting, all of the, not everybody, of course, not the blacks or the mulattoes and so forth, the Indians, they couldn't attend, but only the wealthy landowners. They came together in a cabildo, a town meeting, to decide what are we going to do here? Uh, the, the, kingdom, uh, the king in Spain is not a Spanish person. And so what they did, they established a provisional government called a junta. <clears throat> and that junta, and they called their territory then, the United Provinces of the Rio de la Plata. 
And they said, we will sort of be a, a caretaker government until King Ferdinand VII or someone, uh, another Spanish king, gets back onto the, the uh, throne. So they did not favor open rebellion against Spain. But they were just sort of waiting to see what was going to happen. This, by the way, if you ever make to Buenos Aires, is the uh, building where the Cabildo met and where the Junta uh, governed the area during this period of time. It's very well maintained, worth a visit. My wife and I were there uh, earlier this year. Okay, well, in all of this confusion, a man by the name of Jose de San Martin came back to his mother country. He had been born in northern uh, current day Argentina, had moved with his family back to Spain. So he was a Creole, okay? A European born in the New World. Moved back to Spain, was an, in the Spanish army for over 20 years, distinguished himself, rose to the level of colonel. But when he saw all of this stuff going on, he said, I need to go home and be with my people. His first loyalty was to the people in the New World, in his native Argentina. So he arrived in Buenos Aires, 1812, just, and Jonas, Joseph Bonaparte was still on the throne at this point in time, and he offered his services to the junta that was running things in, in that area. They asked him to organize an army and fight against the Spanish royalists. And this he did with a great deal of success. <coughs> He was able to win a number of battles in that immediate area. Now, in the New World, in South America, I should say, the center of the evil empire, Spain, was up in Peru. That's where a lot of, uh, of the troops were, uh, a lot of wealth and so forth. And he realized that if the United Provinces uh, of the Rio de la Plata and other uh, New World Spanish colonies were ever to be able to uh, succeed in a battle against, uh, or gain their independence from Spain, he would need to go up to Peru and fight them there. And that's a long way to Peru. Here's uh, Buenos Aires, Peru. It doesn't show on this map, but it's quite a, quite a bit higher. He would have had to march several thousand miles with his army through enemy territory, fighting every step of the way. And this is where his strategic genius came in. He said, they'll expect me to do that, but I'm going to go to the western edge and go over into, cross the Andes into Chile. And that's what he did. The crossing of the Andes in January 1817. And this campaign has been likened to Hannibal's crossing of the Alps to get... Uh, to the, the Romans, and it was just a horrible ordeal. They had to climb, go 300 miles in 21 days, 12,000 feet above sea level. One third of his men and all of their, their beasts of burden died. It was just a real death march. But they were able to outflank the Spaniards and come in in a very unexpected direction. A couple of battles were fought in Chile, and his army of the Andes was victorious. The Battle of Chabuco and the Battle of Maipo. And there's Santiago, Chile, for those of you who are familiar with the location of the capital of Chile. Very successful. He was not only a strategic genius, but a tactical genius. And as you can see, the royalist soldiers lost more than 6,000, and his army of the Andes lost only about a thousand people. So he's way down there in Chile. He still wants to get up to Peru somehow. He was able to sail there rather than march all the way from Buenos Aires up to Lima. He sailed there, went on a cruise. How was he able to do that? The Spanish fleet was in control of that area, but actually they weren't. At this period of time, England had a lot of surplus warships, 250 warships, the best technology available, heavily armed, the, really the, 
the best warships in the world at that time, but they were being mothballed. They weren't fighting anybody. In addition, there were a lot of unemployed sailors and captains who needed employment. So what happened? Money went over to England. Ships that were fully manned by British sailors and captains came over to the Pacific Ocean off of Chile. The leader of that fleet was a man by Sir, Sir Thomas Cochrane. Uh, and apparently he had been quite capable and, and uh, successful in the Napoleonic Wars. And it was he who estab established the Chilean Navy, a mercenary. He was very successful with the kind of, of uh, capability they had in terms of warship and skilled sailors and captains. They totally decimated the Spanish Navy in that part of the world, successfully blockaded the coasts of Chile and Peru, sunk a lot of Spanish ships, and he was the one who took San Martin and his army of the Andes thousands of miles up the coast. Now, I don't know if any of you have read any of the Horatio Hornblower series or the Jack Aubrey series, Patrick O'Brien. Both of these characters are based on this man. Okay, at this point in time, a new actor enters the stage of history. His name, Simon Jose Antonio de la Santísima Trinidad Bolivar Palacios Ponte Blanco. In other words, Simon Bolivar. He was born into a very wealthy, well-to-do family in, in uh, Venezuela, current day Venezuela. It wasn't Venezuela back then, but near Caracas and uh, became orphaned when he was six years old. Went to Europe, to those universities I was talking about. He was exposed to the Enlightenment thinking, and he became imbued with the fervor to free the new world of its Spanish uh, rulers. <clears throat> Very interesting person, as you can see by this description of his personality. But apparently a very magnetic and charismatic individual. And the quote at the bottom of the screen from one of his soldiers describes how they felt about him. Strong, bold, capable of anything, lived like the toughest soldiers, without fear of beast, heat, cold, or the enemy. He was only five, six feet, uh, five, six, five feet, six inches tall, uh, but he sort of had a Napoleonic complex, perhaps. He became the driving force behind the war of independence and liberation in South America. He had an interesting political philosophy. I wouldn't call it very de democratic at all. He knew that the uneducated masses, the indigenous Indians, the slaves, and many of the mulattoes and mestizos really were uneducated and just really not capable of participating in a democracy. And therefore, <clears throat> his philosophy was, we shall avoid elections, which always result in that great scourge of republics, anarchy had no faith at all in the common man. And in addition, he, he had studied the governments of Europe and the United States and thought that maybe a hybrid combination of a monarchy and a democratic or federal republic would be the right solution. And not only that, but it would be a very, very strong, strong executive. The president would serve for life and then be succeeded by a vice president who he appointed. And of course, then that person would serve for life and he would appoint his successor and so on. And so that was not a very democratic way of going about things, but that was his philosophy. And that was the kind of government that he envisioned post-independence. Well, he was a miserable failure for the better part of a decade suffered multiple defeats in Colombia. He was exiled uh, overseas in Curaçao, Jamaica, and Haiti, lived for a long time overseas. And, but gradually, he was able to win the support of the powerful Creoles in that part of the world. We're talking about Northern South America. And he led them in a bloody civil war. And it, it was a horrible war within what we call current day Venezuela. More than 134,000 men, women, and children were slaughtered by the different uh, combatants in that civil war. And Simon Bolivar was no angel by any means. 
Uh, there were 1,300 royalist officers or soldiers who had been imprisoned, and he had them all executed. <clears throat> Helping his cause were these mercenaries. I talked about the, the uh, Navy, the English Navy mercenaries. Well, there was a group called the British Legion, many of them from, from England and Ireland, and they, they, were, they had a great deal of, of uh, sympathy for what Boulevard and the, the uh, revolutionaries were trying to do, but also they were in need of employment. So they came over, and they became really his strongest a uh, military arm, and wherever there was a, a problem in a battle, he would send the, uh, the legion there, and invariably, they won the battle. Okay, and so just a very brief summary of the battles that took place now during this period of time. Boyacá occurred in uh, what we call current-day Colombia. It freed Colombia from Spanish control, and then Carabobo, they moved over to current-day Venezuela and freed it from Spanish control and then down to Pinchacha and secured the independence of the area that we currently call Ecuador. So after a long period of defeats, he still kept pressing forward and finally it, the tide turned and he won battle after battle after battle. And so he had made it as far as Ecuador. Now remember our friend San Martin was camped out in Peru. He had been waiting. He knew his army was not strong enough to overwhelm the Spanish defenses in what we call current day Peru. So he was waiting there for a couple of years while Bolivar was fighting all of these battles in the north. And finally, San Martin and Bolivar got together in an area near current day Guayaquil in Ecuador. <clears throat> Nobody knows what happened in that meeting. Now, San Martin was a soldier, first and last a soldier. Brilliant, but not a politician. Bolivar had a lot of military experience, but he was primarily a politician. And when those two men got together, it would have been very interesting to hear how they were deciding what the next step should be. All we know is that San Martin left that meeting bitterly disappointed left his army, went back down to uh, Argentina, and moved to Europe where he died about 28 years later. Uh, sort of a sad story in a way because he was a very, very great military leader. But somehow or another, Bolivar was able to join the Army of the Andes with his armies that he had used in the battles in the north. And they fought a couple of very, very important battles. The Battle of Hunin, uh, <clears throat> which uh, was the decisive battle for the independence of Peru, and then the really big battle of the War of Independence. Ayacucho took place in southern Peru, and many people consider that really to be the end of the wars for, of liberation for the South American uh, colonies of Spain. Now, going way back, okay, we've, the war has been won, and the Spaniards have been evicted. Okay, what happens now? Much earlier, even before all of these things I've been talking about happened, an individual by the name of Francisco Miranda, de Miranda, and he was a mentor for Bolivar, he had a vision of a country running all the way from Cape Horn up to the top of um, the Spanish possessions in the middle of what we call the United States right now. That's how far the Spanish jurisdiction went. A country that went the full length, almost the full length of North and South America. But that was not going to happen. There were a lot of reasons for that. And I, I thought, as I was preparing this presentation, I thought, I think it would be very enlightening to compare the American colonies and the Spanish-American colonies, their wars for independence, because I think we're going to begin to understand why things happened as they did in the United States and why they happened as they did in Spanish uh, America. So let's look at political and military co cooperation between the colonies in North America, highly significant. 
They were cooperating a great deal from all the way from the northern part of the 13 colonies to the southernmost area. However, in Spanish America, hardly any collaboration or coordination. It wasn't until Miranda's arm, uh, I'm sorry, San Martin's army of the Andes united with Bolivar that any cooperation and coordination began. Population and culture, very homogenous. In the American colonies, the 13 colonies, loyalists, patriots, and slaves, generally speaking, those three categories of individuals. And by the way, the loyalists constituted about 20% of uh, the people living in the 13 colonies, so it was a very, very substantial group. And not only that, but the colonies were right next to each other. You could ride, a, uh, if you had enough time, you could ride a horse from one end to the other in the space of uh, three weeks or a month or thereabouts. Totally different in South America. Very diverse. I talked about that caste system a few minutes ago. Those different levels of peninsulares and, and creoles and mulatos and mestizos and Indians and slaves and so forth. And it was, there were even further gradations. Very highly rigid caste system. Totally different than the American colonies. Separated by mountain ranges, long distances, impassable jungles. So there was really hardly any uh, collaboration and cooperation going on there. External threats. This is a very important uh, thing to understand. When a group of people are threatened by external entities, they bond together because for their own mutual defense. And so it was in the American colonies, the British in Canada and the Western territories. It was almost like a, a, a truce or an armistice. They... The, the British still felt like, the England still felt like those were our colonies. And so there was an ongoing threat even after uh, the American colonies uh, won that, the Revolutionary War. And to the south, Spaniards in Florida and Louisiana as well. So they were surrounded by European powers. And who knew what they were going to do to this fledgling, very defenseless a uh, group of colonies that later became the United States. No external threats in Spanish America. They had more to fear from each other than from foreign countries. So there wasn't this unifying aspect of an external threat. And then finally, very, and last but certainly not least, the leadership in these two different areas. Look at those names. It's almost a miracle that at that point in time and in that location, men of such great capability and integrity were there to lead the Revolutionary War as well as to lead the country that came out of it. Post-independence leadership in Spanish American colonies, military leaders, warlords, their whole intent was on gaining the spoils of war, not preserving any kind of independence. It was all for me. Bolivar was so discouraged at the end of his life. In fact, he was quoted as saying, I have plowed the sea. I foresee civil war and disorder breaking out in all directions and spreading from country to country. And in fact, that's what actually happened. He tried to bring them together in Panama, the Congress of Panama, after the Spaniards had been evicted. And uh, just a brief aside, my wife and I were walking around uh, a part of Panama City, and we came across the location where the Congress took place. And usually it's not open to the public. I was able to talk our way in. Actually, we're in the small room, touched the table where Boulevard and the other leaders of the newly independent colonies came together. But it did not work. They were trying, he was trying to get them to develop sort of a, a mutual defense pact, a military pact, sort of like NATO possibly, uh, a parliamentary assembly, sort of a federation, if you will, of independent countries that would, would coordinate. Only one country, Grand Colombia, signed the treaty. 
It was a total and absolute failure. So, as a result of all of these things, this is the situation that occurred after that. Freedom, democracy, reason were tossed by the wayside. After all, these warlords and caudillos and uh, military leaders, they were not about to uh, enable the masses to run the government. <clears throat> the wealthy Creoles took the wealth and power. There was widespread corruption. No systematic rule of law. Political instability, Peru, 20 governments in 20 years. The blacks and the Indians were consigned to virtual slavery. And without sounding overly dramatic here, and I hope I'm not being hyperbolic, a lot of this is a pretty good description of Central and South America today. Every country in South America other than Brazil moved from lawlessness to despotism. In other words, dictatorships. So let's now take a look at Brazil, since we haven't talked about Brazil yet. Totally different situation. All of the blue here were S Spanish uh, colonies. This is Brazil in green. Now, it was a totally different situation. You wouldn't expect that to be the case because they shared a continent there, but it was a totally different circumstance. Portugal and Spain had had a different philosophy about their colonies in the New World. Portugal um, had, had given a certain degree of independence and lenience to their colony, colonists in Brazil, much more than the Spaniards had given to their colonists. Uh, commercial monopolies, Spain had a very strong commercial monopoly. The Spanish colonies could only trade with Spain and no other countries. Portugal had a much more lenient philosophy and the Brazilians, or the people who lived in current day Brazil, were able to trade with other countries. The Creoles in Brazil were included. They were not excluded from these high uh, administrative positions. They were in the power structure. Now, one thing that's very important, though, they did not really want independence from Portugal. And why is that? <clears throat> because 50% of the people who lived in what we call Brazil today were slaves. Uh, I don't know if you remember that, that uh, slide that I had the other day when I was talking about the Caribbean. Most of the slaves, at least 40% of the slaves, went to Brazil from Africa, all the, the mass of slaves who came across the ocean. And so there was a great many of them, and the Creoles were scared to death that if they got independence, that might lead to the, the liberation of the slaves and, in effect, threaten their control, their economic control, and their control over the slaves. So they were very, very reluctant to break away from Portugal. Well, let's see what happened. John VI was king of Portugal when Napoleon invaded Portugal. Now, you remember I said that the king of Spain was captured and put in a, in a prison in, in France. The whole royal family in Portugal, nobles, I mean, it took about seven or eight ships. They fled Portugal before Napoleon's army arrived. And where did they go? To Brazil. In effect, the center of power for the Portuguese empire went from Lisbon to Brazil. Rio de Janeiro, de facto capital of Portugal and the entire Portuguese empire. And 1815, a few years later, King John, who had been there now for a few years, he said, Brazil is equal in status to Portugal. He wasn't sure whether he'd ever be able to go back because of Napoleon's army being there. And so he gave Brazil equal status with Portugal, the mother country. But he was forced to return to Portugal after the French were evicted. There was sort of a power vacuum and some democratic forces were trying to reduce the, constant, the authority, the legitimacy of the Portuguese king who was way across the ocean anyway. And so he realized if he was going to project, protect his uh, monarchy, he had to go back to Portugal and leave Brazil. 
he left his son in charge in Brazil. He realized that there were problems ahead, and he wanted, maybe he wanted to make sure that he could go back to Brazil if things didn't work out in Portugal. But he told his son, I think he had an, uh, an understanding how the future was going to unfold. He told his son, Pedro, Brazil will soon be separated from Portugal. If so, and I'm leaving you in charge, at the age of 24, left him in charge. If so, put the crown on your head before some other adventurer grabs it. And in fact, that is exactly what happened. In 1822, the Portuguese Legislative Assembly, uh, King John never got his full powers back, and this Legislative Assembly threatened to revoke that high status of equality of Brazil with Portugal. In other words, they were a, going to make them a colony again. And at that point in time, Pedro declared Brazil's independence from Portugal. A Portuguese king, or actually the son of the Portuguese king, ironically, was declaring independence from Portugal. Totally, totally different than the Spanish-American experience. Well, the whole country united. There were a few Portuguese army units sprinkled throughout the country who fought him, but they were very weak and small in number, and the last Portuguese army unit surrendered fairly quickly. So, the more things change, the more they remain the same. It turns out that just a few years later, King John, who is over in Portugal, the father of Pedro, died. And Pedro had to then go to Portugal in order to, pr again, protect the monarchy that he was part of. He wanted to preserve the monarchy for his daughter so that she could become queen. So he left Brazil. And what did he do? He appointed his son to be the regent. He left behind just like he had been left behind by his father. A little bit different this time because... Pedro II was only five years old. <laughs> Pedro I was 24 when his father went to Portugal. Pedro II was five years old. Uh, and so, of course, there were some caretaker uh, advisors and so forth to protect him. And he became emperor at the ripe old age of 15. Wow. <laughs> I can't imagine that. But he ended up, this, it's really strange the way history works out, he ended up being an exceptionally constructive and progressive leader during the six or so decades of his reign. Remember, slaves were a large percentage of the population. He worked actively in favor of the abolition of slavery. During his six decades, in contrast, total contrast to the Spanish-American colonies in South America, there was political stability. Freedom of speech was safeguarded, you know, just across their borders to the south, to the west, and to the north. Dictators were, were ruling with, with bloodshed and, and restricting human rights and so forth. He respected civil rights. The country grew and became vibrant, and even today, it's, it's probably the powerhouse economy in South America, of all of them. Six decades he ruled, and you know, he became emperor at the age of 15, so six decades, that's, he was about 75 then, when he was overthrown by a military coup d'etat. He, he wasn't a big, uh, uh, charismatic leader. He was just a, you know, a very solid, stable, behind-the-scenes kind of a guy. And apparently some very selfish uh, leaders decided they could overthrow him, and they did. And he was, went into exile in Europe. But it was almost with a sigh of relief. He said, I have worked too hard. I am too tired. I will go rest now, then. And so he traveled throughout Europe, staying in flea bag hotels, he didn't have much money, and after a, a decade or so, he died an entirely pen penniless individual. And he had a box of Brazilian soil 
that in his will he said, put this in my casket so that my land will be near me after I have died. I think he's a pretty wonderful example for all of us. And so that's the end of the uh, South American Wars of Independence. I've sure enjoyed sharing it with you. I hope you didn't find it too boring. And tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, we're going to talk about the various interventions, occupations, invasions, and so forth of the United States and the Caribbean. See you tomorrow morning.